Gun there. All right. Uh, well, welcome everyone. Let's get the show started. My name is Eric Osterman, and this is Office Hours. It's February twenty uh, second. Uh, or no, what am I reading? I am reading the wrong notes. That was funny. <laughs> All right. It's That's February twenty second, and things like COVID nineteen are just starting. Just starting out. <laughs> All right, get that right. It's July 22nd, my friends. My name is Eric Osterman, and I'll be leading the conversation. I'm the founder and CEO of Cloud Posse. We're a DevOps accelerator. That means we help companies own their infrastructure in record time by building it with you and then showing you the ropes. If that sounds interesting, head over to cloudposse.com slash quiz to get started. Again, that's cloudposse.com slash quiz to get started. For those of you new to the call, the format is very informal. My goal is to get your questions answered. So feel free to unmute yourself at any time if you want to jump in and participate. If you're tuning in from our podcast or YouTube channel, you can register for these live and interactive sessions by going to cloudposse.com slash office hours. We host these calls every week. We'll automatically post a video recording of this session to the Office Hours channel so that you can share it with your team. So with that said, let's get this started. We got a number of cool announcements uh, that I'd like to bring up today. Uh, one is, uh, first of all, that you know Amazon e uh, EKS 1.17 dropped in the past uh, week or so. Uh, this is really exciting, mostly just to see that EKS, which was criticized for lagging the uh, Kubernetes release cycles pretty, uh, pretty badly, is now uh, really uh, keeping up to date with these new releases. Uh, I believe there's a number of uh, security feature or security uh, fixes in 1.17, so if you haven't upgraded, that might be something to uh, check out the release notes for. Uh, the other really exciting announcement, skipping around here a little bit, is that uh, AWS CDK, ha together in, with a partnership with HashiCorp, announced um, Terraform support. And for those not familiar with CDK is, so CDK is Amazon's uh, cloud, de uh, cloud developer kit or something. Uh, framework. And it is a way to write um, uh, in whatever language you prefer, whether it be TypeScript or uh, Java or uh, Python, I forget all the language bindings it has. It's kind of like Pulumi. It allows you to uh, generate the code to provision infrastructure. So originally CDK was strictly for cloud formation. And CloudFormation, if you've dealt with that, is a real pain in the butt. It's you know ugly YAML with an arcane syntax that nobody wants to deal with. Well, before that, it was JSON. Now I think uh, it's YAML as well. Obviously, they're interoperable, those formats. Well, so CDK um, put a nicer sugar coating around that. The problem was that it was strictly for AWS. Terraform, uh, it uses HCL, of course, and HCL is uh, entirely interchangeable with JSON. In fact, you can name all your TF files tf.json and they'll just work as regular Terraform code. So since what CDK is really a, a framework or language for generating documents like that, it works. It, it was a logical next choice to have CDK generate Terraform code. Um, this is interesting because unlike Pulumi, I believe Pulumi doesn't work with Terraform modules. But if you're a company that does a lot of Terraform and a lot of Terraform modules like Cloud Posse, then this gets exciting because uh, you can actually write higher order, uh, use a higher order language uh, that might be more intuitive to your developers to use. You know, we haven't kicked the tires on it. Uh, we'll see uh, you know, where, where this goes. Uh, obviously, documentation will be uh, the biggest challenge. If there isn't good documentation for how do I do this thing in CDK that was really easy for me to do in Terraform, well, I don't know if we, we just introduced just another problem. Um, any questions about the AWS CDK support for Terraform? All right. So uh, the other thing, if you're in the uh, Terraform channel uh, on Sweet Ops, uh, the Slack team, uh, you'll see that uh, RC1 for a 0 0.13 just dropped. Uh, so that's exciting. 
Uh, I think, uh, I don't know, how many, how many release candidates did they have for 0 0.12? Was it uh, two or three? Um, but my guess is that means that 0 0.13 is going to drop uh, imminently here. Uh, and 0 0.13, as we've talked about before, adds the ability to enable or disable modules, have module dependencies, iterate over modules, uh, stuff like that. Right. The uh, ability to use third-party providers uh, yes. is the, the one I'm most excited about. Yeah, that's a good one. Thanks for bringing that up. So for the, anybody, yeah, go on. Oh, I was going to go back to CDK for a second. My question for there was, is it going to mean the death of Pulumi? Because AWS <laughs> is behind CDK. Because that's, that's exactly what Pulumi is, right? It's, it it's, is. Yeah. it's you know, imperative front end for Terraform. It is. Because Pulumi uses all the Terraform providers. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I want to root for the underdog, and uh, Pulumi is a good underdog to root for, but I, I, wouldn't, I would not be happy if I was uh, on, on that uh, team right now. Um, I think, uh, you know, one, it, these companies also got to look for an exit at some point. Who is most likely now to acquire uh, Pulumi down, down the road? Uh, Azure. <laughs> Azure then. Yeah, so Plumi becomes uh, part of that. Yeah, uh, Microsoft's cloud uh, offering, perhaps. Uh, but obviously, AWS just crossed that out um, because uh, they're continuing to invest, invest in CDK. They've taken uh, uh, different approaches. Uh, what I think is interesting about this approach with CDK is they're doing what people have kind of done already for Terraform before 0 0.12, right? 0 0.12 alleviated a lot of this stuff, but people were using, um, uh, I forget the Python uh, template engine frequently for uh, generating Terraform code. Ninja. Ninja, yeah, Jinja. Uh, Jinja exactly. yeah. yeah, Jinja for that. And uh, this is basically a formal Jinja approach, but using CDK as you know, a well-maintained framework by Amazon. Plus, it synthesizes two things. You can now re do um, uh, cloud formation very well, and you can do Terraform perhaps very well. I think it's too early to be uh, seen if it's going to be an effective way of doing it. Uh, I don't know if I emphasize this, but AWS CDK was originally just for AWS, but now with Terraform, AWS CDK with Terraform is not just for uh, AWS. You can use AWS CDK with Terraform for Google Cloud for you know, Cloudflare, for uh, everything else. All right, uh, moving on then, um, you know, GitHub Actions, we, uh, we've been bringing that up a lot. Um, you know, uh, Martine on our team shared this with me, which is a link uh, to a, a repo where it makes it easy to deploy um, the GitHub runners in your own uh, VPC using spot instances. So if you're frustrated with the performance of your GitHub actions, this might be something uh, worth checking out. And I'll share these links in the uh, Slack channel here. Uh, it doesn't let me um, copy and paste from there. Oh, well. Uh, uh, Martin, can you uh, copy these in and paste them into the uh, Slack channel for me? For oh. Thanks. Sure. Oh. All right, so talking points. We got a few questions that were posted in office hours, others uh, that I kind of browsed around what was going on in the sweet ops community over the past week. And uh, here's some interesting ones that uh, we wanna talk about. So Muhaha, uh, thanks for, man, you're, you're always asking awesome questions. So thanks uh, for asking another good one here. Let me pull that up. Um, in Slack here, copy link to that. Nope. Just uh, pulling this up in the browser so everyone can follow along if you uh, see the screen share. So Moha asks, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking for some tool that can handle installing, updating binary packages in Linux. Uh, a lot of binaries like Helm, Helm file, customize, YTT, 
you know, there's no good package for that or no active package maintained. Um, not all packages are available as assets for downloading via GitHub, like Helm. Um, some, uh, you know, have uh, logic for curling the new version, and that'd be fine. Any ideas? So, uh, a bunch of you responded to this already. This was asked actually last Thursday. So, let me pull that up here. You see my window. You scrolled too high. It, yeah. was, it was lower. There we go. So, yeah. So uh, some of the suggestions uh, that were posted here by the community are uh, variant dev. Uh, there's a, yeah. So this is a tool by Momoshu. He has a, a project called uh, Mod. Uh, this can uh, help with that. Uh, so that was one that uh, Muhaha found himself. Uh, I would have recommended that. Uh, yeah, Andrew, uh, you shared this one, I think before on a previous office hours, ASDF, which is kind of like a generic version manager with a huge library of plugins for just getting any package installed and versions. Do you want to add some context to ASDF, um, Andrew? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can, you can go in and create your own, um, you know, plugins for ASDF to do whatever packages you want. Um, a lot of them just, you know, literally just go up to Git, GitHub, go grab the binary, download it, you know, and, but the, the great thing about ASDF is um, you can have multiple versions of the same tool installed and switch between them flawlessly. Yeah. Um, and you can have a text file that can control the version. So there's a dot file called dot tool versions um, that if it's, if there is a dot tool versions in your directory that you're in, you know, and if it's a, if the contents of dot tool versions is, you know, Terraform 0.12.26 or whatever, ASDF will just automatically use Terraform 0.12.26 in that directory, regardless of what the global version that you've chosen to use is, um, which is very powerful when it comes to having, you know, multiple team members and trying to sync versions between multiple team members, just make sure they're all using ASDF and then you're good because tool versions file is something you can put in your Git repository. Yeah, that's a good summary. And I, I yeah, so I think this is nice. Uh, and if like, if you've been using a version manager today, uh, I, you know, I, I, we need another version manager tool. Like, you know, we need a hole in our head. This is getting ridiculous with all these RBM, PyM, you know, RVM, uh, NVM, uh, TFM. Uh, I used to use a bunch of those. I don't use yeah. any of them anymore. I use exactly. ASDF for all of them. Yeah. So, so this is worth uh, consideration that therefore, um, then, uh, I'm going to, you know, obviously I got to, uh, pimp a little bit of cloud posse stuff here. So, uh, two, two things. So, uh, one, uh, uh, you know, alternative uh, approach to this that we've been practicing at Cloud Posse is to get away from local native dependencies and the mess that introduces across projects, across, in our case, customers, across generations of infrastructure, across stages of infrastructure. Uh, you want version pinning, you know you want to do version pinning, well, what if you instead bake that into a Docker image? And that's what our project is here, Cloud Posse Geodesic. And we have like a little animated GIF here. You can kind of see what that is. But, but you, can, uh, you can use this in so many ways. So one way is you can use Docker as your shell. So uh, in this case here, we at Cloud Posse use, uh, uh, it, we, we distribute Geodesic and that's our shell that we use. So for a customer engagement, we inherit from Geodesic pinned to some version. And now that customer has our, our entire tool chain pinned to some version. Um, and to do an upgrade, all you do is change the version of Geodesic. So that's one way to use it. Another interesting way is so like, you know, uh, Andrew men mentioned ASDF. There's a, there's a tool called um, EnvCly. Uh, and EnvCly is interesting because if you still want more of that native, native, native experience, but you don't want to have to figure out how to get all these binaries running. NCLI, what this does is this lets you uh, run all those commands in Docker 
but there, uh, and this is like a shim to run them natively locally. So it, it takes care of mounting, you know, mounting the current working directory uh, and running that command in the client. So what's pretty interesting here, and we've been, and I know um, uh, Igor on my team has been doing this, two things. We have, we have geodesic, but we also have the cloud posse build harness. So the build harness is distributed as uh, a Docker image as well. And this has a number of make files. And a build harness comes in to your organization where you're building Java projects, you're building Go projects, you're building uh, NPM projects. Those are basically compiled now too. Uh, you're, you're, build, you're doing Terraform and you want a consistent way of running all of that that is well-defined for your company. And that's what the build harness is. So you can combine nvcly with build harness and now you, you still have all those tools bundled and versioned in one Docker image that you can run with a native feeling, or you can run geodesic uh, or, or the, you know, any combination of those two things. Um, so that was that. Then the other question that Muhaha, or like un, unfurling uh, what uh, Muhaha says here, is uh, you know, a way of installing those binary packages. Um, so I, I've shown alternative ways, ways of addressing this underlying problem, not answering the specific question. So to answer the specific question, we dealt with this very early on at Cloud Posse as well. Uh, so that's why we have our packages distribution. So if you go to Cloud Posse, github.com slash Cloud Posse slash packages, uh, this is where we distribute our tool chain in a in, in a few different ways. Uh, one is, ag you know, kind of distro agnostic. The other is, uh, you know, Alpine. So these are, this is our tool chain here. This is a great place to dig around for other cool tools you haven't yet discovered, uh, things that we, we like to use, uh, some less than others. But, you know, if you haven't seen all, uh, all less or AWS, uh, it's a great alternative cli for uh, command line usage against AWS. So these, these are, uh, all distributed as Alpine packages that if you're using Alpine as your base image, you can just add a little snippet of code to your Docker file that looks like this. And now you have the, the Cloud Posse distribution of tools. And uh, we support like parallel versions of Helm, parallel versions of, uh, of Terraform, parallel versions of kubectl. Uh, all these commands because inevitably when you're working with, you know, uh, infrastructure that spans generations of tools, you, you inevitably need multiple versions still installed. And the, uh, so if we, the other way you can use our cloud posse packages though, is exactly the way you're describing here, like just installing, updating the binary packages. And that's what we've done. So here is a way of leveraging our, uh, our packages repo in a way in your make targets where you can just install any package from any vendor uh, that we support uh, and it becomes a binary package. So what that looks like is if, if you add that to your make file, you can just run, like if you want to install AWS vault, You can just run make install. In this case, what it would look like is, uh, well, you don't see here. So just look in the URL bar here. So what it would be is like, I would run make packages install um, AWS vault. And that would just install the latest version of AWS vault, or I can say AWS vault version equals, you know, 1.2.3 and then that'll go install that binary. So because we're using make, it works on basically, you know, every, you know, developer environment where you have make installed, which is, you know, on Macs and Linux and uh, presumably under WSL these days uh, as well. So uh, three, three ways you can use our packages, Alpine packages, make, make installs, and we also distribute a Docker image with all the binaries on that one Docker image. So you can just use that as one stage in your Docker file and copy those binaries from that Docker image. So you don't need to worry about uh, getting those binaries out uh, from the upstream uh, from GitHub. Cool, any questions about uh, our packages or geodesic or build harness?
Uh, one other thing just while I'm here. So what's cool about our packages thing is like, we want to start moving towards uh, Debian or Ubuntu. So uh, I, I have an open pull request here for adding uh, Debian support. Uh, this hasn't dropped yet. I'm not, I can't say when it will, but it's pretty rad because we can just use the FPM tool to repackage, uh, FPM stands for F and package manager. Uh, to repackage our packages now for any distro. So we can uh, have Debian packages, RPM packages uh, as well. So uh, I expect our packages, the distribution to expand uh, as we try and support more use cases at Cloud Posse. So, uh, Muhammad, I love the you... creativity of the open source community. Yeah. <laughs> we need more of that. I, I struggle so much with, you know, like we, we came up with a, a container kind of like geodesic and, you know, I, we final I finally won, won them over and we, we named it Anvil because my team name is team Vulcan and, you know, Vulcan is the God of the forge. But uh, for, you know, for the longest time they wanted to call it, you know, tools container or whatever. And it's like FPM is, is or like how YAML is just yet another markup language. I love it. Yeah. yeah, I like those little uh, Easter eggs kind of once you go and look into what, you know, how did, how did this uh, evolve? Uh, uh, so yeah, this is, uh, this, is your, uh, this is your alternative to geodesic, right, Andrew? Uh, you call it Dad's Garage? Oh yeah, this is, this is the one I made. Like, this is my personal project. But yeah. I finally got my team to do one for work. Nice. Nice. So th that's good. Winning them over uh, one company at a time. Uh, yeah. I, know, I know we've had that in, in the past as well. All right. Uh, any, uh, any more questions before we move on to the next question? All right. Uh, Alex, are you on the call today? Guess you were not able to make it. Uh, but I'm, I know you follow our podcast uh, and YouTube channel. So, uh, do, I'll, I'll give you the heads up. So uh, you asked last week, I missed your message. And you know, are there benefits to switching to EKS from COPS uh, at this time? Uh, and uh, we, we got, we got uh, some pros and cons for this that we'll share and I'm sure others here will uh, chime in. I'm gonna jot off as much as I can do off the top of my head on like what, why you should go one way or another. Uh, and I think we have some COPS aficionados here too that can stand up for COPS. Uh, so, you know, Cloud Posse, we, we were working with COPS for the last few years. We switched over. We've been managing our EKS modules for the last uh, year or so. We've officially switched over to EKS as our primary um, solution for Kubernetes on AWS this year in January. And now we're supporting it uh, for all of our new engagements that we do. Uh, we waited a long time for EKS just because it didn't seem rad until they had the managed node pools. So this is where you can have something closer to GKE. But if you've used GKE before, EKS is not GKE. It is, it is uh, a, a gnarly beast to operate, uh, especially with Terraform. Uh, and and ha it's been difficult for us to get some uh, pretty nice modules uh, in place for this. So what the benefits right now for switching to EKS is obviously uh, easier upgrades between versions of the control plane. COPS has had some gnarly updates. Uh, I think like uh, 1.11 to 1.12 or 1.13 was a pretty gnarly update when um, etcd went from v2 to v3. Uh, those kinds of problems should hopefully be eliminated when you have a fully managed control plane by AWS. That said, uh, recent upgrades from 1 you know, 14 or 15 to 1.16 were not turnkey. You couldn't just bump that version uh, of your EKS cluster and apply it and expect your Kubernetes cluster was working because you also had to update the version of the CNI plugin and that, is, uh, that, that isn't done by the EKS control plane. So I, I was a little bit blown away that we couldn't just upgrade the EKS version and see that work. But even then, Kubernetes did not disappoint. We had to still upgrade the version parameter of all the resources to drop the V1 beta one because now it's officially just V1. So, uh, so those upgrades you know, would affect you whether you're on COPS or EKS. 
Now, the managed node pools are pretty sweet. We've had good luck with them. And so long as you're sticking within the traditionally ways you want to use Kubernetes, then by all means, use the managed EKS nodes. But if you're trying to use Jenkins, uh, building Docker in Docker, as opposed to using uh, you know, BuildKit or some of the non-privileged ways of building Docker images, but uh, it's not going to work on the managed node pools because you need to control the args to AWS. Uh, sorry, sorry, to uh, the API server when you uh, provision the uh, EKS node pools. You need to, I forget the flag exactly. Um, it's something related to uh, host networking that needs to be enabled in order for your Docker builds to be able to communicate outside of the cluster to pull third party sources like RPMs, you need to be able to control those flags. And so you cannot do Docker and Docker on managed node pools. Um, let's see, uh, the first class support for IAM roles on your pods, we can do that. This actually relates to the next question after this, uh, posed by Ryan Smith uh, as a poll in the SweetOps uh, channel. But first class support for IAM roles is a big thing in um, EKS, right? And this was a strap on that I am amazed worked, ever worked uh, in, in Kubernetes. Uh, basically, started with Cube to IAM. So, Cube to IAM is like a uh, man in the middle proxy that intercepts requests for the metadata API and based on. Uh, Based on that request, it will uh, generate um, uh, STS tokens that it then give exposes as environment variables to your no 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 sorry I, I said I misspoke that it exposes the metadata API endpoint that so long as your services use the SDK properly will use this and get back uh, a response with your STS tokens that uh, are short lived. The problem with cube to IAM was uh, I guess I'll answer both these at the same time with cube to IAM is that every node in your cluster where that has that pod that needs that role is going to make that same request and refresh it every hour or refresh it every 15 minutes or whatever that timeout is. So what you've done is created a uh, AWS IAM DOS attack or bot network uh, and uh, Amazon doesn't like that. So they block you when you do that. And then that blocks, that can nuke your entire cluster's ability to talk to AWS. So if you're using cube to, cube to IAM today, stop, don't use it. We've been burned countless times before KIAM. So um, KIAM changed that architecture around. KIAM is uh, predominantly what's used on COPS these days uh, to get those IAM uh, roles. And with KIAM, you have a different architecture. You have a single master that's caching those roles negotiating with AWS and all your agents are running on all your other nodes and they're authenticating with uh, the, um, the, eight, the, the, the central server for KIM using MTLS, mutual TLS, and getting that rollback. It's, it's a much more intelligent architecture, but it's a pain. You got to manage all your TLS certificates. So then you got to roll out cert manager and then cert manager is going to uh, generate new certificates. But then how are you going to rotate your certificates for, for uh, when that, those expire and avoid a blackout? So then you got to deploy reloader and reloader is going to now reload your, uh, your, your uh, KIM agents and, and servers everywhere. So it becomes this massive Rube Goldberg apparatus inside Kubernetes to manage IAM with COPS. So services accounts is the way to go. E this is like the biggest win. I, one of the biggest wins I feel like going with EKS is the, you know, out of the box service account support. I believe you can do it with COPS. I just haven't, tr we haven't tried it because we moved over to it. Oh, actually, let me open this up to the floor. Anybody using service accounts with COPS today? Anybody using COPS today? All right, so uh, I guess, uh, you know, the silence is either, <laughs> uh, yeah, don't read too much into it. I'm sure many are still using uh, both, but um, the, I think the most telling thing is people probably aren't using service accounts and that's what's So is anybody using EKS then? Yeah, is anybody using EKS? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah. Oh, okay. That I, I've heard ugly <laughs> things about cops in the last few months. They've, 
Yeah. Are they are they mer do they have any merit? Well, I mean, so I no, I well, okay, so I don't know specifically what they were. Some of the things levied against cops recently, well, recently, let's say within the last 10 months, 8 months, sure. has been just that their uh the release uh cycle for cops has been very slow. Their their ability to keep up with the Kubernetes releases has been poor. Um, and the, their AMIs have been hopelessly out of date with lots of exploits. Uh, and as of today ish, oh, and, and then certificates automatically expire after one year. And that's a massive Easter egg, uh, for the next, uh, generation managing you know, your, your clusters. So all of those have been addressed now. So they, they've discontinued managing their own, uh, um, Linux distro. They've, uh, they've made it much easier to rotate your cert certificates in your cluster. And uh, they now, uh, they're, they're all the way up to 1.18 for uh, EKS, or sorry, for Kubernetes uh, support in uh, at least beta. So, the, the, and they're releasing frequently and they're supporting more versions, whether it be in alpha or beta sooner. So, uh, you know, I think, I think they've, that's a good sign that they're, they're, it shows still massive investment by the community, even though I think there's a big brain drain happening. Uh, in the cops community. Does cops have a corporate backer? Uh, I mean, they you know, like Confluent for Kafka or like, you know, Rancher yeah. for Rancher or, you know, whatever. I mean, they are a top level Kubernetes project, uh, but I don't know if they have an official. No, so maybe CNCF is their corporate backer or whatever. Yeah, so then it's probably uh, related to uh, CNCF. Anybody know it. the answer to that one? Uh, yeah, Let's see if there's any uh, promotions here. Some of the some of the open source products out there, like you would be you would be very surprised to find out who their you know their main corporate you know uh, backing is. Like like you know the bank Capital One has you know a bunch of different open source products that are actually kind of used a lot. And I was like, I never would have thought a bank was you know. They've been very forward on that. I've seen, I've, I've uh, more than once stumbled across their GitHub repo. I, I was it a Terraform, was it a Terraform operator? Or I forget what it was, was one interesting project I saw coming out of there. Um, but yeah, it, it is interesting to stock these. Do you guys have any favorite organizations you like to stock uh, uh, on GitHub to see what kind of projects uh, they're working on? Cloud Posse? <laughs> yeah. No, oh, thank Swear you. I'm not brown nosing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah. This is a shout out here. Stakater, uh, Stakater, Stakater. They're a Swedish uh, company. They have a bunch of cool projects. I love to dig around here uh, for little gems. If you haven't done that, I brought them up before in the past. And uh, also Variant uh, Dev. This is anything Mumoshu does is uh, worth stocking. So he has a lot of interesting things that he's working on. Uh, th this is his personal organization called Variant Dev. Uh, he's doing cool things. All right, cool. Uh, any questions on the, that? Or any, what else do you guys want to add to this uh, EKS versus COPS? Is it time to upgrade or move over to it uh, today? I'll throw in a third option of Rancher. I've been very happy with them. Yeah, what you, as compared to cops, not you know, Rancher and EKS are kind of different. Yeah, or uh, Michael Holt, uh, I saw you talking, but you might be muted and talking to somebody else. I just want to make sure it wasn't directed towards us. All right, um, Andrew. Uh, yeah, so uh, Rancher. Yeah, what do you think about their their acquisition now? Uh, is that uh, good or bad? Uh, yet to be determined, but you know, it won't be so bad that I'm going to stop using them. Yeah. Just feels like it's so often for open source. It just feels like a death knell for a lot of uh, these things. Not always. So like, uh, you know, core OS got acquired by Red Hat, right? Yeah. But like Quay is still a very pop, you know, Red Hat has, has taken on Quay and is comp like running with it, you know, yeah. running and it's still a great product. Downtime. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, you can run Quay on-prem. Yeah. 
So we, we use Quay for, for a pretty long time. And um, for a while, when you would get on a support call, they would route you to the Red Hat support team. And none of the support people knew about Quay. And so it would be oh, very hard to do anything with Quay because we would, I would get on a call and then get routed to them and they'd be like, we don't even know what Quay is. <laughs> but have you tried restarting your computer? Yeah, um, we have since switched <laughs> to ECR. Yeah, no, I think that's worthy uh, to do it. But that's interesting. So you're were, you were, uh, paying for Quay uh, support uh, and uh, that's what, uh, what you got. We weren't paying for support. We were paying Quay for the number of repositories we can have. And I, I was actually trying to increase it and it, it wasn't working through the web UI, which is why I was trying to call them and we needed more repos. Um, and yeah, trying to pay them more money, but yeah. it, just, it just wasn't working and they couldn't figure out uh, who to send me to, to get that figured out. <laughs> and I can take a long time to, to get that squared away. And now Red Hat wants big score. fish. Red Hat so, wants big fish. Like they don't care about going from 20 repos to 30 repos. You know, they couldn't care less about that. They want big fish. Probably. Yeah. Um, not, not that I'm, you know, trying to defend them at all. I'm, I'm really yeah, not. no, this is <laughs> so often the case. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think I was actually trying to go from 25 to 50. Yeah, so 100% growth. Yeah, not enough. Yeah, so, but now that you're on ECR, is that a decision uh, you regret or you're happy with? Um, we haven't had 10 hours of not being able to access our image repo, so. Um, That's a good sign. I think everything has been good. Also, we still pay play because it's like 50 bucks a month or something. Um, which So we just actually push to both repos now. Okay. Another reason maybe why they, their support isn't really bending over backwards for 50 bucks a month, but yeah. Uh, was that, so are you using the ECR scanning at all? Since I know you guys are operating in a regulated space? Yeah. Cool. We, how, how, did you set up CloudWatch for alarms for that? Or how's that working? How are you, how are you making it actionable? So I'm going to be honest, it's not actionable right now. Um, but uh, we have gone in and, and done vulnerability and, uh, patches um, to our images, uh, but like not on like a, like a bi-weekly thing or something. Um, but we did hire recently our first security engineer who I hope will make that actionable though in the future. That is cool. Yeah. Uh, we would support uh, contributions to the Cloud Posse, Terraform AWS ECR repo for uh, sending those escalations to SNS topics. Uh, and then uh, from there, you know, who knows? Um, what was I going to say? Uh, anybody else uh, made ECR uh, security alerts actionable? I, I was in the problem. Oh, sorry. Go, Go on. ahead. Okay, well, I mean, we're in the process of, of working on that kind of stuff. I don't, I wouldn't, you know, what, what I have experience with has, you know, been just doing a scan as I'm building the container, like in the pipeline. Um, My understanding is though, with the ECR scanning though, is that it's, um, it can't, it's not a blocking thing. Like right. uh, you get that notification later on when that scan right. runs. So the uh, question for us has been, is scanning things sitting in the registry the right way to go? Or do we need to be scanning things running in the cluster? Or do we need to be doing both? Or can we get away with only one and which one is okay? And we came up to the conclusion that, you know, we can save some time by only doing one or the other and scanning in the cluster is more important than scanning something sitting in the registry. Yeah. Is what we came up with. So you're using therefore a different tool set than not the ECR container scanning. Well, I mean, under the, underneath it all, it's all Claire, right? True. True. One is managed, one is DIY. Um, actually, there's an operator. 
that I can't, I can't remember what it's called. Oh, can you share that in the uh, Office Hours channel? Be cool. Yeah, when I figure it out. It's so, the container security operator. So I'm going to hijack here. I got a question for you guys. I've been working on compiling a list of uh, AWS limitations and feature requests that I want to escalate uh, to our uh, AWS uh, uh, contact. So uh, what are some AWS limitations um, that frustrate you that you wish uh, were addressed? You uh, being the collective, everyone on the call. <laughs> I'll give you guys some ideas to seed the conversation. Uh, one interesting thing is uh, AWS ELBs, why don't they support TLS by default? Uh, like RDS supports that, uh, Elastic Cache supports that. Uh, pretty much every service AWS launches these days supports uh, TLS certificates out of the box without ACM. ACM is great if you need a branded, you know, vanity TLS certificate, but what if you can just have a AWS, Amazon AWS.com cert uh, where you don't care about uh, that origin um, name. Uh, so that was like one of the ones uh, that frustrates us. I just saw your, your, your bit about the node groups. I, I personally did not like feel like node groups were that big of an improvement to what we had been using prior to that. Yeah. I don't know how everybody else feels though. Um, I, like the the part that node groups does well is provision your auto scaling group and and all the like configuration for that um but like that's already automated doing it through terraform and then you still get the like configurability of doing it that way and i just don't understand like why like so someone would go the node group route does that mean that they have no idea how auto scaling groups work and like how would they debug it if something were to go wrong it comes down to i think more along the sd managing the whole sdlc so uh the base ami you don't need to worry about updates there patching if vulnerabilities come out uh that can be done faster presumably by aws um Upgrades, I, you know, I, like I was saying, I think they're rough around the edges right now, but I can only imagine they're going to improve the uh, automation around upgrades on EKS. Um, so I, that's where I think the value is right now. But yeah, the auto scale groups are pretty easy to deploy with Terraform. So it's a, it's a very marginal improvement over them. Okay, so, so you're like betting on it being a bigger, a bigger difference in the future. Yeah, uh, exactly. You know, they, they've been very strategic about rolling out the most painful pieces in that order, uh, like the EKS masters and then the nodes uh, and then the Fargate. I think they're going to continue in that. One thing that's a little bit disconcerting is like there are these issues that are really popular under the roadmap. Well, you know, it's really nice that AWS, first of all, has made this roadmap public or at least uh, given a way of uh, for users to give feedback, but the, you know, like this, one, like this, uh, to me, this was a shoe in that they were just going to knock this out. I mean, it's already supported for EC ECS having, I forget what it's called, but the, uh, spe the, the, the high density CNIs, um, or, or ENIs, and they don't have that yet for EKS. So you're artificially limited on the number of pods you can run on nodes. And it's great for their pockets because it just forces you to run more nodes, but I don't like that. Uh, and like with cops, you get really high density um, if you're running small containers. So I was just recently um, reading an article about this and why why it is, and it was something to do with um, that each and every pod in the each and every pod in the cluster gets its own IP address that comes out of your subnet. Yeah. Well, it does, and it, and it gets an ENI too, and it, so it's like a very heavy-handed uh, implementation, but it's very performant versus the original mesh done by Calico or something else like that. Yeah, but it was they did it to 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 preserve compatibility with some some AWS network layer yeah. that I don't remember the specifics, but like that's why they did it that way. What what is the max pod? Is it a hundred? It depends on the instance type. Uh, and, so, the, and the small instances have very few ENIs. 
And um, for ECS, because you mentioned I use, I use that feature for e ECS to have more uh, e and attachments yeah. for, the, for EC2 instance. But this was, this was a feature that you need to enable. So it was kind of beta. Yeah. So there was like a standard and you could enable more through enabling feature flag. I'm not sure if it went out of beta and if it's supported for ECS yeah. like by default. That's interesting. Yeah. So maybe it's not GA with ECS as the default uh, networking uh, mode. This was back in February, I guess. It was not standard. This max pod count is a game changer or deal breaker for us. Uh, say that again, Brian. The max pod count on EKS. Yeah, that too. That is... Uh, I guess going back to your... I mean, there's technically a max pod count just on Kubernetes itself. I forget what it is. Uh, my, one, my knowledge on it's that... It's 110 is, per 30, node. 110 per node. Or, okay. Yeah, maybe 110. Um, but we, you can go above that. Like we run 150 to 170, I think, around there per node. But like for, so we run mostly R4 to X larges and that's only 58 in EKS. Mm. But you, you're, you've switched from COPS to EKS now, right? Not for our application clusters. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So this is the thing you're, you're still. Um... It was actually like, I, I had been investigating it. It was like, it's, um, it was like when I was investigating the node groups and stuff, but I didn't know about this max pod count though. Yeah. That is. There's a cubelet parameter. It's called max pods. Oh, I'm talking about EK. EKS, it seems like uh -oh. we have 58 pods on an R4 2X large. Got it. For us, we run about 170 right now. Yeah, so, th so that's, uh, and that's determined by the instance type then. So, yeah. So that was, so that was one of the ones, um, you know, accounts, uh, account, yeah. So account automation is pretty painful on AWS. Uh, the fact that you can't programmatically destroy an AWS account without, without uh, human intervention going in and uh, clicking some stuff. Um, this, like we would like to have end to end automation to test this stuff, but we can never go below the account layer for that, that testing. Mm. CDK documentation, account limits. Does this frustrate anybody? You don't really, you can't easily alert or alarm on your account limits being reached um, unless you have, uh, unless you pony up for um, a higher level of AWS support. To me, this seems like it should be. I, I've been uh, I've been investigating that. So, uh, I I guess you you got my AWS limit monitor. This is one that I that I found because there's a uh, there's a trusted advisor. But the, these to, build on it. They require yeah. trusted advisor to work. Uh, no, the one that I found doesn't, and it uh, it actually used the service limits and it. Um, it query uh, API of AWS and gets all the information, how many EC2 instances you're running, and it compares to what limit you have, and hmm. alerts, you can alert on it. I can, I can check that out. Yeah, can you share? Been, and it's yeah. not this one you're saying? It's not the AWS Labs one? Um, I'm not sure exactly what this one is. That, that'd be interesting to share that because this is one of these things that it can cause a forced outage. Like when you, when you, you trust it that in AWS, you're able to scale out, let's say in some region, but you can't because you, you didn't have your limits raised there because you hadn't hit it before, but now you actually need it. And now you got to open a support case and wait for that whole rigmarole. So um, I don't like that. It's been hard sometimes just to figure out what the limit is. Yeah. Cause like we've like, we, we, you know, we've had a couple of, of resource types that we've increased the limit a couple of times. Yeah. So it's like, you know, and we haven't done it in a while. So it's like, what is our limit now? How, how close are we to it? It's like, I had a hard time even figuring out what the limit was. Yeah. Uh, DNSSEC, this was one that I just brought up. 
that I thought uh, was interesting that Amazon uh, doesn't support it at the DNS record level, only at um, the registrar level. So uh, has anybody else been bit by this from a compliance perspective? All right. Uh, this is one that, this is an issue, I don't really think it's a, this is just a bug that's been affecting us. I don't think it's actually an AWS problem per se. Um, has anybody worked around this issue yet? That there's no good way to destroy an EKS cluster uh, with uh, CloudWatch logs enabled? Uh, there's uh, basically, you need the, the log group to be destroyed after the EKS cluster, but for some reason, the Terraform provider isn't doing that, even with explicit dependencies defined. And because the EKS cluster has default permissions that allow it to create a log watch group, even you delete the log watch group, but because it has permission to create it, then it creates one. And now you suddenly have this uh, orphaned uh, log watch group out there that's unmanaged by Terraform. And next time you try and create the cluster, it doesn't work. All right. Uh, yeah, so any any other gripes, complaints that I should add to our list that we share? I got one. All uh, right. This is All Eric Burr. Right. Hey, uh, so <clears throat> the Terraform that I inherited to spin up our entire stack kind of uh, a CloudFront distribution with Edge Lambdas to control some access stuff that take between, I don't know, an hour, two hours, and a day or more to delete. So you cannot do a clean Terraform destroy without those things. So I wound up pulling the whole CloudFront piece out to a separate state directory. And now I'm thinking of putting it back in since I'm not in like a dev cycle that's going, you know, where this needs to happen a lot. But that's a true pain in the ass to me. Yeah, no, this is this I, I hear this one frequently as well. So I'm really glad you reminded me on it. Uh, it is just but just CloudFront, like if you've used Cloudflare and then you go to CloudFront, it just feels so arcane. Uh, like it, back in the days we used Akamai, it's the same. It's like making a change takes 30 minutes or an hour. And that's like death on a production site. If you have some configuration error, now you have a forced 30 hour uh, Stop talking about it. It makes me yeah. Crazy, you, you know, do the EBGBs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, good one. Yeah. So I'll, I'll elaborate on that before I send this off. Thank you for bringing that up. The other thing that I'm dissatisfied with in general is metrics on usage. Um, we're a data dog shop, so we've got everything cranking as a data dog, um, and the billing stuff looks like utter garbage. Like when I compare it to our actual bills, yeah. when I compare, like it's, it's like seemingly no relationship whatsoever. I, I'm interested. I, this just hit me right now. Um, slight segue. So we use Ops Genie. Ops Genie's, uh, you know, like page duty. One thing that's kind of neat is that rather than build out their whole re own reporting platform, what they did is they just uh, embedded Looker. And then they, uh, you can uh, do custom reports and st stuff through Looker. Uh, now, segueing back into the AWS thing, it seems like AWS should just present all that information inside of a Redshift-like uh, type of database so that you have uh, truly the ability to report on it. Which brings me to my next question. Has anybody loaded their AWS billing information or seen any uh, productive posts on how to do that with Redshift? That yeah, was, uh, yeah, was my concern. <laughs> uh, can the billing be exported to S3? It can be exported to S3. Yeah. It's just gnarly raw data uh, that, you, that to roll it up is non-trivial. I've tried rolling it up many times. Um, I'm, so we use Metabase, uh, you know, Cloud Posse, and I ingest all the billing reports from S3 into Metabase. But uh, I haven't successfully designed the SQL queries yet to report on that data accurately. Uh, so sometimes I get freaked out that our bill is fifteen thousand dollars when it's actually five. 
Shifting so back anyone... to the Datadog comments, uh, I agree that uh, they've added feature AI features and other things to their product, but not to billing. Mm -hmm. And so when a developer had a, uh, a logging loop that put out 1,200 messages per second, uh, we had a $6,000 Datadog bill and didn't know it until the uh, billing cycle because you don't see stuff like that and you can't set alert thresholds for billing and you can't set anomaly detection for billing. And unless you're looking at uh, your logs every day, um, actually, if the person paying the bill isn't looking at the logs, developers can look at them and just ignore shit like that. But yeah. uh, when you get the bill, you're effed. Yeah, and your you your comment here was specifically related to Datadog, right? That that's it. Yeah, yeah I yeah. think Eric had said something about that too. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. No, uh, good, good, good comment there. Uh, yeah, and I've been warned about exactly that. Yeah. Like you know, there was this one month before you started where all of a sudden we were like 1.5 what we expected, and if we are you know on in front of that, <clears throat> and it's like hey. It's going to be twice as much this month. We were messing around with stuff. They're like, that's one thing, but don't fucking surprise us. And I was like, uh, so that made this that much more of an acute does, issue. Does the data dog log, um, yeah, it, it seems like what, what, there's no incentive for them to implement this. So I guess that's why they don't have it. But what would be nice is that they have the ability of sampling na naturally. So, hey, look, we're paying for 1.5 million events uh, a month. Uh, please sample my data so that it never goes over 1.5 million events and uh, you know, give that cost predictability. Yeah, because it's insulting how expensive that bill can get with Datadog. Um, so, uh, but you guys mentioned two other things that are really interesting uh, and I've been really impressed with this product so far in the demos I've seen uh, and we're starting to look into integrating it at Cloud Posse is this Tallowflow and they do exactly two things that you guys mentioned. One is anomaly detection uh, and, for, and the other is forecasting. And uh, they, they alarm on these things and they support multiple mediums for that, whether it be web, hooks, or Slack. Uh, what's interesting about this, and if it fits within your risk profiles, is that uh, they, can, uh, they consume your, your CloudWatch logs, your CloudTrail logs, so they know everything happening in your infrastructure. You can send them any other signals that you have, like when you're doing deployments or uh, other cost information that impacts you, uh, like uh, stuff from Datadog. And then they will do the correlations uh, and they can uh, identify uh, with some degree of accuracy uh, what events led to your cost spiking. Uh, and what I like about their product compared to other solutions that do this stuff is they use Prometheus. They use Grafana, they manage it for you, but they give you an endpoint that you can access. So you have the full query language and power of that at your disposal as developers. And two is that um, they share a Google Drive sheet with you with the raw data structured with the pivot tables and all that stuff. So where you still need to come up with another report, you can do that without spending you know, half your week copying and pasting uh, information from the AWS spend site you know, pulling all this in, which anybody who's been in a position of management or, you know, something, you know, involved with AWS here has probably had to do at some point. And it sucks. All right. So we are at the end of the hour today. So I really thank everyone for sharing. I think we had a great conversation today. Uh, we went, we covered a lot of topics. So uh, please go back and uh, share this with your team if, uh, if that was interesting for any of you. Um, if you haven't yet already subscribed to our YouTube channel, uh, I would like uh, you, know, you guys to check that out. If it's interesting, you can go back and see our full back catalog of past episodes. Um, and I'll share the link uh, for the YouTube channel in our Slack channel. You can also go to, uh, let's see if I, I, I should add it to this slide. I don't know why I didn't, but you can go to cpco.io slash YouTube, cpco.io slash YouTube, and it'll uh, send you there. All right. Thanks, guys. See you guys next week. Same place, same time. Thanks again, Eric. Thank you, man.